Uh, just uh, my disclosures are in your packet that was uh, given out of registration. So I am a urologist. I've been uh, doing uh, urology for 35 years now, and one of the areas of interest has been advanced prostate cancer in the last seven to 10 years. I uh, run our uh, advanced, I've been direct, I'm the director of our advanced prostate cancer clinics in Florida. We've got seven of those, and we're seeing about uh, eight, right now it's at about 730 patients uh, that are on these advanced therapies. So what I'm gonna do today is, uh, is break this down. I know that not everybody here in the room takes care of patients with APC or advanced prostate cancer. What I'd like to come away with this today is that I wanna keep this at a level that everybody feels comfortable with. And really, the burning questions that I'm gonna to bring to you today are the ones that I get from my colleagues and wanna travel around and talk to people about what they're doing in their clinics, the questions that they ask me. And the first question that we have is the simplest really of all, and that is where to begin. And I can't stress enough how important it is to adequately categorize these patients into the four buckets. And there's really just two questions that you need to ask. And before I go into a room to see any, any new patient or established patient in my APC clinic, I've got to ask myself those two questions and update my information. Are they metastatic or not based on radiographic imaging? And that's based really on conventional for the most part. And are they castrate resistant or castrate sensitive? Do I need more information? Are they on ADT? Is there, do we know what their PSA and testosterone is? Do we know what their current imaging is within the last six to 12 months? We must categorize them because all of the, all of the treatments that we use are based on which bucket they fall into. So I'm just gonna review real quick, and you've seen these before at this meeting, but the non-metastatic is uh, castrate sensitive is really just another way of saying biochemical recurrent, and for the most part, ADT therapy, whether it's intermittent or continuous, is what we use. On the metastatic side, you've got ADT with uh, docetaxel and then the, the three androgen pathway inhibitors. On the castrate resistant side, ADT and then three androgen pathway inhibitors, and then the metastatic CRPC, that's our longer list of op options for our patients. But you will notice, and this list of course keeps getting longer and longer with the addition now in the last couple of years with the PARP inhibitors here and then with the immuno-oncologics, -onco and the list just keeps growing. But you'll notice that ADT is still on this list and it's on every one of these buckets and it is the foundation still for, for therapy in all of these patients. So the other question that I get a lot is, how do I select the optimal androgen pathway inhibitor? And, and our options are, are, are listed there. And you'll notice that uh, one of them, abiraterone, this is a biosynthesis inhibitor. The other three are androgen receptor inhibitors. So we kind of categorize them and group them together as androgen pathway inhibitors. We can look at efficacy and we can look at tolerability. And I think that similar to other areas in urology where we can use ED or OAB as examples, in most cases the drugs are very similar in efficacy and I would say that that's true here. And oftentimes it's the tolerability that really sets them aside and, 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 and really leads to what, what drug we choose. The drug-drug interactions, we heard a little bit about that earlier today, can also play a role in here. Sometimes it's just cost, insurance, and access issues. And sometimes it's just who you had lunch with that day that maybe is the first person on your mind and that's the drug that you're gonna use. Uh, but without head-to-head -head trials, there's really no clear answer. But what I can tell you is that androgen deprivation therapy alone is simply not good enough. And in 2022, it's really a tragedy if patients that are in these stages are treated with ADT alone. In the M0 or non-metastatic space, these are the oral options that were approved. Uh, it's interesting that apalutamide was first and it only took one week from the time the publication came out till the time the FDA approved it. That was based on the MFS or metastasis free survival, which was just overwhelmingly uh, dramatic uh, improvement compared to the uh, placebo plus ADT arm alone. And then we've got the enzalutamide next and then darolutamide in July of 2019. This just looks at the three trials, this Prosper, Spartan, and Aramis trial. I'm not gonna go through each of these, but just realize that they were very similarly designed trials I think, and uh, lots of patients, over a thousand patients in each trial, and it was the MFS that really got everybody's attention. And in each case here, and this was a very good surrogate for overall survival, turned out in the final analysis and all these trials here that it really panned out nicely. But you can see the numbers are very similar. And I think it's very, very hard in any way, shape, or form, just based on efficacy to say that one drug is necessarily better than the other. When we look at the side effect profiles, I think that most people would agree that the real problem with these drugs, uh, that the, the most complaints that we hear from patients is right over here, it's the fatigue or the CNS side effects. 
And if there's any difference between these drugs, and of course this is just a side-to-side -side analysis, but not definitely not a, a comparison in any type of, of trial, but you do see that with darolutamide, there may be a, a little bit lower incidence of the fatigue in CNS. And the theory there is that there may be some issues with uh, blood-brain barrier penetration. None of that's been shown in human models. There have been some mice uh, and, uh, and rat models that have suggested that there's limited penetration of the blood-brain barrier. And darolutamide is a different molecule, as, as was pointed out a little earlier tonight, that it is a little bit different compared to the other two. And so there may be some, some uh, truth to that. But I think that still, when you compare the uh, adverse events across the board, they're still very, very similar. So in the M1 castrate sensitive group, these are our choices that we have. Does a tax lie include? It's not an API, but I'll include it for comparison purposes. And we can put these up on a chart as well uh, from charted from 2015. So this was the first indication, got a lot of people's attention to be able to use docetaxel uh, in combination with ADT in patients uh, with metastatic uh, castrate sensitive, especially high volume. And you can see here that the median overall survival was really quite quite beneficial to those patients. Didn't really get into the urologist wheelhouse until, until down a little bit lower on the list here. Even with abiraterone, with this 53 versus 36 month median overall survival advantage, <laughs> surprisingly, urologists were still a little shy because they really didn't like the idea of having to order prednisone for the patient. It was a little bit scary, and it seems a little silly now when we look back on it, but it was really true. And it wasn't until apalutamide and enzalutamide came along that there was a little bit more broad utilization here. You'll see here on the overall survival and the final analysis that the, that the numbers really are very supportive of, uh, of, of far, far, far superior to ADT alone. I want to point out here this, uh, this uh, PFS2 I think is kind of unique and interesting with apalutamide. The, the second progression after failure of a first-line androgen pathway inhibitor was a 38% risk, risk reduction. And that would suggest that you know, we're not really playing our trump card early and we're not missing out. Uh, we're not, not really worrying about uh, being too aggressive early on. It actually turns out that being aggressive early on is better. In the M1 uh, metastatic CRPC patient, we only have two oral options. We've had them for a long time. Uh, it was over 10 years now that we've had abiraterone and enzalutamide. Initially, we could only use them with prior chemotherapy, but then it was just a year or two later that we were able to uh, use them uh, without prior chemotherapy. And uh, this is from the, the, uh, uh, Dr. Ryan, 2015, looking at overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival. And this was the, the, the number that people remember here, the four-month overall survival advantage with abiraterone versus placebo. And, uh, and I think that when you're talking about uh, this advanced, very far advanced group of patients with metastatic disease, castrate-resistant disease, four months, I think, uh, is, is very, very significant for these patients. And then in the chemo-naive uh, M1 CRPC, the enzalutamide data in the PREVAIL trial, you can see here that the uh, co-primary endpoints were met, and very similar. This uh, four-month uh, radiographic progression-free survival, uh, I'm sorry, 83% 83, 83, 83 reduction in risk of progression, but the four-month overall survival here was very similar to what we saw with abiraterone. But clearly no head-to-head -head trials, no clear advantage, in my opinion, to one or the other. One other way to look at this, uh, this was from, uh, from China in 2020, uh, comparing, this is a systematic review meta-analysis, comparing clinical efficacy and safety of abiraterone and enzalutamide in metastatic CRPC. This was 14 studies, over 3,000 patients. And the conclusions here, comparing the two, where PSA response was higher for enzalutamide patients, enzalutamide was associated with increased adverse events, no difference in perceived cognitive impairment in either group, enzalutamide with increased fatigue risk, and I think that that, that really uh, jives with what we see in the real world. But the conclusion was that enzalutamide was more efficacious with a little bit higher side effects, particularly fatigue. So the other question that I get a lot is when to declare failure of our first-line androgen pathway inhibitor. And I think it really all boils down to adequately measuring disease progression. And how you do that can be either based on PSA progression, radiographic progression, or symptomatic progression. And I tell folks that really, I know that the patients really focus on PSA progression, but of these three, it's really the least important. And, uh, and clearly, uh, we, we need to resist the temptation to bail out on a first-line therapy that's working just, just due to PSA progression alone. One of the ways that we can assess the degree of androgen resistance in metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients is uh, we do have some tools there. Uh, this is ARV7, which is available. Uh, it's, a, it's a blood test looking at 
the clone of cells that are missing this ligand binding domain on the receptor. And without that ligand binding domain, these, these cells are very resistant to androgen manipulation. So you can lower their testosterone levels all you want. You can block that, attempt to block the receptor all you want, but it really doesn't do any good to these patients. And these patients are best served with moving straight to chemotherapy. So where this test is most beneficial is not necessarily in switching from one androgen pathway inhibitor to another, but if you do have a PSA failure and you're wondering if it's time to bail or not, you may do an ARV7 to see whether or not that patient may be better suited for chemotherapy right away, or if you should just hang on a little bit longer with the current therapy. So if failing first-line therapy, another question that I get is switching to another androgen pathway inhibitor or change therapy completely. And I think that we really have a fairly clear answer here. This is uh, from British Columbia, six cancer centers, looking at newly diagnosed metastatic CRPC. Group A was the abiraterone group that progressed, followed by crossover to enzalutamide, and then group B was the opposite. And the endpoints here were tying to PSA progression and PSA response. So is it, is it more beneficial to start with ABI and, and convert to ENZA, start with ENZA and convert to ABI, or is it not a good idea in either case? And the findings here, most of the patients did cross over. The time, uh, the group, group A time to second PSA progression, that was the group that started with abiraterone was about 19 months. The group that started with with um, enzalutamide was 15 months. And interestingly, the PSA response was only seen in the group that shifted from ABI to ENZA. The group that went from ENZA to ABI was really almost no response whatsoever. So enzalutamide did show some activity as a second line API. Abiraterone really did not. And I think the answer to this question is, is if you're on ab abiraterone and considering switching, maybe enzalutamide might be reasonable, although I still not, would not necessarily recommend it. But clearly, if you're starting with enzalutamide, there's no advantage to uh, switching to abiraterone. This is from the CARD trial. From two, uh, it was published in 2019, looking at switching from, uh, from, a, from an androgen pathway inhibitor to, uh, to a chemotherapy. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. Adverse events were, were measured here. And, and the findings, uh, just to show that the arms were evenly matched up here between the two groups, there was no uh, bias in the groups uh, of patients that were selected. And you can see here, sorry, you can see here that uh, the uh, progression, uh, radiographic progression-free survival, switching to cabazitaxel as opposed to switching to another androgen pathway inhibitor was quite significantly different. And then in all of the subgroups, cabazitaxel favored best. So, and here we look at uh, the difference in uh, median overall survival between the groups and progression-free survival. So I think that what uh, the final thoughts on this, and this was also uh, given at the AUA meeting, uh, that uh, the patient report outcomes showed a clear superiority with cabazitaxel with regard to pain response, time to pain progression, time to s symptomatic skeletal events. And, uh, and I think that the bottom here is the most important thing, that, that more of the same treatment rarely benefits patients, and switching from one androgen pathway inhibitor to another is really not helpful. And then finally, I just want to touch on PARP inhibitors because this is a little bit mysterious to urologists in general. I think it gives a little bit of an of a uncomfort level. And what PARPs do is they're the enzyme that helps repair single-stranded breaks in DNA. In patients that have an intact uh, homologous recombination repair system, for example, BRCA, then those cells can repair themselves. If they're missing that, if there's a mutation in the B BRCA, mutation, then those single-stranded breaks can lead to double-stranded breaks. And this is a theory of, uh, gen uh, of uh, pathogenesis towards cancer. The way it works to help in cancer, uh, cancer, getting rid of cancer, is if we inhibit those PARPs, we can drive the system towards cancer cell death. If the PARPs are intact and, and, the, and the cancer cells are allowed to repair, then cancer cells will proliferate. If the PARPs are inhibited, and the patient has one of these homologous recombination repair deficiencies, then, then the cells don't have the mechanism to repair the double-stranded breaks, and you drive the systems towards cancer cell death. We have uh, olaparib and recaparib, which are available now. There are some differences in indications here. Just uh, briefly, the, uh, with olaparib, these are all metastatic castry-resistant patients, a little bit broader group of of um, gen uh, genetic defects that you can apply it to. And with recaparib, it's just the BRCAs, and they do have to have had prior chemotherapy uh, or not be uh, uh, able to take chemotherapy. Germline and somatic testing is the key here. I'm not going to really spend any time on that, just to say that it is important to do it. And when you look at uh, these trials, 
uh, olaparib, I'll just uh, jump ahead here, that there was a significant reduction in the uh, ra radiographic progression, also overall survival advantage. And this is what you really need to know here. The 31% reduction in the risk of death in the cohort that had the BRCA1 and 2 uh, was the group that, that, did the, that did the best. So uh, I'm just going to move ahead here. Anemia, thrombocytopenia, nausea, vomit, diarrhea, anemia far and away is the one that you need to pay attention to. And then Triton was the rucaparib trial. This was the phase 2 trial, and the Triton 3 data is not uh, mature yet or available. We hope to probably have that, something to say about that next, next time around. So first and foremost, the high importance of performing germline and or somatic testing. I can't stress that enough. Uh, we're trying to get that message out to people that are in these APC centers. And so my answer is any patient who meets criteria for either drug should be considered for a PARP inhibitor, but especially those that have the BRCA2 mutation, they seem to clearly do the best. <laughs> 